Hello guys, welcome to History Facts. In today's video we are discussing secrets of the Shogun's harem. Enjoy the video. November 1861 Sunlight glitters on the lances and pikes of hundreds of attendants and guards as a procession winds slowly along a mountain road in central Japan. At the heart of the procession, hidden in a luxurious palanquin borne on the shoulders of eight men, is a 15-year-old girl. Her name is Princess Kazu and she is the half-sister of the Emperor. She is being escorted from her home in the imperial capital, Kyoto, to the great city of Edo to marry the Shogun, who is also 15 and whom she has never met. The marriage is a last-ditch attempt to bring together the rival clans who are ripping Japan apart in civil war, those who support the Shogun and those who fight in the name of the Emperor. The Shoguns are military rulers. The word Shogun means Generalissimo. For the last 250 years, the same family of Shoguns has ruled Japan and given it peace and prosperity. The Emperor, meanwhile, is a figurehead with prestige but no power who never leaves his vast rambling palace in Kyoto. Princess Kazu Now, however, the Shogun's enemies have taken up arms under the pretext that the Emperor should be restored to power. Princess Kazu's is the most splendid procession that has ever passed through these mountains. In the villages along the way there are detailed records of where she stopped to rest, look at the view, dine or spend the night, and of how many thousands of pillows, plates, cups, chopsticks, porters and horses each village had to provide. The imperial chefs left recipes of the dishes they prepared for her, soup, tofu, rice and grilled fish brought from Kyoto. There is even a photograph of her taking years later. She looks thin and miserable, engulfed in the stiff folds of her many kimonos. Lady Tsuguko, her chief lady-in-waiting, wrote of the princess and the shogun, neither of them wanted the marriage. Astonishingly for a woman of her time, the princess made her feelings known. On the road she wrote poems describing her sadness and resignation to her fate. After three long weeks on the road, the procession arrives in Edo. Soon to be known as Tokyo, it is the largest city in the world. The travelers wend through the streets past gawking crowds, cross several moats, and finally reach the massive white battlements of Edo Castle. They file across the innermost moat, and the huge double gates swing shut as the last retainers disappear inside. Sex with the Shogun when the shogun slept with a concubine, the whole procedure was tightly regulated. First, the girl had to be stripped and searched to make sure there were no weapons or notes on her body or in her long, luxurious hair. No hairpins were allowed and combs had to be checked to make sure there was no cutting edge. If it was the girl's first time, one of the old ladies would check she was a virgin. Once she and the shogun were in bed, there would be two ladies-in-waiting lying wide awake in the room, one on each side. Two more listened behind screens not far away to ensure that the girl did not make any requests for herself or her family. No doubt all this formality was as oppressive for the shogun as for the concubine. The early shoguns took to spending a lot of time in the bath where there was just one cheerful low-class girl to scrub his back. Quite a few children were born to bath attendants and known as the children of the bath. Eventually, the elders put an end to this practice and thereafter the shogun had to bath in the men's palace. Edo Castle Edo Castle was Japan's Versailles. An enormous complex of buildings a mile across and four miles in circumference, it was like Buckingham Palace combined with the Houses of Parliament. It was where the shogun lived and, with the help of an army of government officials, ruled the country. But unlike Versailles, there were no women mingling with the crowds of noblemen and peering flirtatiously over the tops of their fans. 
As in the Forbidden City in Beijing and the seraglios of the Ottoman Sultans, the ladies of Edo Castle lived in seclusion. Visitors were admitted no further than the edge of the Omot, the outer palace, where the bureaucrats dealt with affairs of state. Beyond that lay the Nakoku or Middle Palace, the residence of the Shogun and his personal servants. On the far side of that was a solid wall slicing through the complex of buildings, pierced with a single opening. Only one man could pass through the door, the Shogun. Ooku The Ooku, the great interior or women's palace, was larger than the Omote and the Nakoku put together. So much mystery surrounds it that it is not even clear how many women lived there, though the most commonly accepted figure is 3,000. All the women, from the grandest lady to the lowliest maid, had to swear never to reveal its secrets, even to their closest family. Most never did. The closest ordinary people came to them was on the rare occasions when a lady went out and the crowd might catch a glimpse of her getting out of her palanquin. Not long after Princess Kazu arrived there, Edo Castle was surrendered to the imperial forces. The palace was disbanded and the women left to support themselves as best they could. But they still kept silence. It was only many years later, when they were old, that a few revealed a little about what life in the palace had been like. The women remembered the rules that encircled every aspect of life in the palace and the strict attention to rank. The different positions ranged from the seven elders who ran the palace with a rod of iron to the nuns who performed official duties, the ladies in charge of hand water and tobacco, those who specialized in ritual music and ritual events, and, right at the bottom, the honorable pups or honorable dogs who ran errands and lived on leftovers. There was one line that could never be crossed, between those of noble birth who were allowed to enter the presence of the Shogun and those below, who throughout their entire careers would never see him. Daily Life at Edo Palace Daily life in the palace was a picture of elegance. The ladies spent their mornings at their toilet, preparing for the Shogun's three daily visits. Each had maids to help her. The first job was to shave her eyebrows and freshen up the blacking on her teeth. At that time, all adult women blackened their teeth with a dye of sumac leaf gall, sake, and iron. A woman with unpainted teeth would have looked barbarous. Next, the maid painted the lady's face with white makeup. She outlined her eyes in black rouged her cheeks and dabbed red safflower paste on her lips, then oiled and combed her long glossy hair and coiled it into a knot. There were different hairstyles for each rank and also different styles of kimono. As the clock moved towards 10 in the morning and again at 2 in the afternoon and 8 in the evening, there was a great flurry and bustle throughout the palace. The highest-ranking women made their way to the upper bell corridor, which led to the double door between the men's and women's palaces. As the castle drums sounded the hour, the cluster of bells that hung by the door jangled. As they knelt waiting to greet the shogun, the words that all the younger women hoped to hear were, What is her name? This was the code that meant they had caught the shogun's eye and he wished to spend the night with them. Concubines Both wives and concubines retired from connubial duties at the age of 30 added to which a lot of children died. So there was a constant need for fresh young concubines. One of the shoguns outdid all the others, the 11th, Ianari, the grandfather of the 15-year-old youth whom Princess Kazu traveled from Kyoto to marry. During his lifetime, 1773 to 1841, he fathered 53 children by 27 concubines, though many of the children died as babies and others were mentally incapacitated or physically disabled. There were also many other women who did not bear children and whose names have not been recorded. Going to pray for the shogun's health for a son 
or at the tombs of the shogun's ancestors, was the one time when women were officially allowed to leave the palace. Over the years, many women, chafing at their enforced chastity, found ways to take advantage of this. The temptation to stray was sometimes irresistible, though the penalties were very severe. The long trunks used to bring kimonos and other goods into the palace were long enough to hold a man, and sometimes they did. Kabuki actors, most of whom moonlighted as male prostitutes in those days, were often smuggled in on a regular basis and women also sometimes smuggled themselves out. But the best opportunity was after the regular temple trips, when ladies often treated their maids to a play at the Kabuki Theater on their way back to the castle. Thanks for watching. Do like, subscribe, and comment.